Yes, well, sure, Ruben Koshta, I want to thank you for coming before the committee, but also thank you for the, the work that you have done for many, many years. And um, to say that the actions of your committee were instrumental, that, that there's no doubt that they were. Um, and I know at the very early stages, uh, the, the blog that you were running, which showed on a weekly basis mm -hmm. the, the amount of uh, guaranteed and unguaranteed debt that was being paid by the state was instrumental in shaping the debate at that point in time and information is power and by putting that into the public domain I think it forced government to deal with them um, with, with with some of the challenges that were coming from groups like yourself and and others within within this house and um, I think it's important just hearing again exactly um, the, the real facts that we're continuing to pay for the Anglo debt uh, on a month by month basis, year by year basis, and will continue for for many times to come. And there's a, a lot of debate in relation to where the economy is at and the upcoming budget and our reducing debt and so on and not borrowing to deal with other social crises. But as you've as you've made it very clear, we continue to to borrow money to actually um, to to destroy or to, 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 to nullify uh, the, the once uh, was a promissory note that was given to Anglo-Irish um, back in, in 2010 and, uh, and, and, um, and, and, and that will continue to go on. I want to ask you, you, you made the point in terms of it's not just economics, it's, it's also the, the rights and wrongs, and I can't agree with you more. Indeed, most of your presentation, there's not anything I can agree with. I, I maybe take exception in terms of some of the bankers here, um, and that's one of the questions I have for you, actually, in, in relation to the jailing of David Trump uh, on, and the fraud that he perpetrated within the uh, Anglo-Irish Bank, obviously the main benefit. Because there may be an appeal in that case, the time is not... Okay. Out for an appeal, so it would be wrong for us to go into naming him and so on. Oh. Okay. I don't want you to get into trouble, you see. Yeah, I'm not going to say that he was guilty of anything else that he hasn't it already been convicted of. General election was gone. He's been very guilty. Like, um. Hmm? Hmm? Yeah, but he may appeal a sentence, that's the point I made. Yeah, okay. Um. Oh, okay. Well, look. Okay. Uh, so, just in relation to in relation to Anglo Irish Bank, and and as current as the situation currently stands, and bear in mind that there may be an appeal in terms of uh, sentence, uh, but it is clear that you know the the conviction was in relation to false information being provided to shareholders and all that, but that could also be. Could argue that affected the minister's decision at the time, uh, because uh, the, the, the records of the bank or the, the books of the bank showed that it was in a better shape than it actually was. Do you believe that that provides any additional scope for a, a, a more a, a robust challenge in relation to this? That if I entered into a contract with you based on information that you provided me that was proven to be fraudulent, then it would nullify my contract with you. Mm -hmm. uh, and is there an argument in, in, in relation to that? The second question I have for you is this. Like, the sin of all of this here is that this is going on like nearly every six months. We have the central bank selling off at an accelerated rate um, the, 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 the now government bonds when the government liquidated IBRC. They did a terrible, terrible thing at that time where they ch changed the promissory note into, into state-owned bonds. Absolutely appalling. And worse so, <laughs> presented it as a victory mm -hmm. for, the, for the Irish people. And while there was some um, important reduction in relation to uh, how we dealt on a year-by-year -year basis, the debt still remained and, and, and the bill was still, still there. But in relation to the fact that so far of the 30 4 billion euro uh, that was in the promissory note uh, we're, we're only left with 14 billion that mm -hmm. hasn't been 14.5 that hasn't been paid back do you is it your view or your group's view uh, that the argument now only centers around what is remaining um, and and that's just a question in terms of the strategy is is it the 14.5 that you 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 suggest that we argued to the ECB that that is the debt. That is the. They are the bonds that are now held by the Central Bank of Ireland, 
the other bonds don't exist anymore. The, the, the money, as you said, have, has been destroyed. Um, or, or do you argue that we should revisit the whole uh, the, the whole issue of the thirty four uh, billion? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, first of all, um, on the conviction or otherwise of any individual, um, we've never concerned ourselves with that at, at all. Because for us, this thing has just been about getting bank debt justice for Ireland and justice for individuals who did whatever they did through that situation. We've never gotten involved in because, you know, that's that's an issue for the courts. That's an issue here for the people here. We know that white collar crime in this country isn't punished anyway. And like, and our view on it is that jailing somebody only costs us money. That if you if you have somebody who is found, you know, committing white collar crime, especially on this scale, then the fitting punishment is to strip them of all their assets, you know, and to put them on a government pension, and a, in, if they're of an age and in a council house, the same as what they've done to an awful lot of people in this country. But actually, jailing them costs us money. So you no, know, I mean the only way you teach manners and you you teach lessons, I think, in white collar crime is to hit them where it hurts. It's greed that causes this. Hit them where it hurts in the pocket. But on the other issue, on the um, what's remaining, what's remaining of the or the, the on the um, the fraudulent behaviour and whether that's grounds for appeal and the contract, of course, is grounds for appeal. But this is what we're talking about as well in the de declaration that was used by not just Anglo but all the Irish banks. Like in the lead up to the Black like Bank Guarantee, I mean, they were misrepresenting and deliberately and knowingly misrepresenting the value, the true and fair value of what they had in their books. They were actually insolvent at that time. They weren't suffering, you know, liquidity problems. They were insolvent if they had declared the true and fair value, which what they were legally obliged to do, not standards. I mean, they were they were complying with the standards, but the standard is one thing, the law is another, and they were. They were not in the, complying with the law, so they misled the government in the lead up to the, to the completely deliberately misled the government in the lead up to the Black Bank Guarantee. But they also misled, like this, the ECB. I think, because I don't think that the ECB were in full, you know, fully aware of what was happening. They should have been, but I don't know if they were. And I think that's why Trichet especially clamped down so hard on the Irish banks because they were using this this standard, which no other country in Europe was using to misrepresent their, their true situation. And it was on those basis that they were getting the money from the ELA, the Emergency Liquidity Assistance Fund. So on that grounds as well, I think it invalidates, like not just the, the promissory notes, but like our, our fight now is just for the 14.5 billion. And in fact, Piers, um, it wouldn't be just for the 31 billion. You know, it's like there was 35 billion euro put into Anglo. So a lot of money was taken out of our national pension reserve fund here, which people forget about. I think it was nearly 20 billion eventually that people forget about. That was taken out of our national pension reserve fund to be put into banks. It wasn't just Papa's borrowers. But we, we took this out of our own pockets and put it into those banks. And the, again, it's not just that money, but the, you look at the interest that would have been lost on that money over the, the years since then as well. So just on the pen, National Pension Reserve Fund, there was conservatively 25 to 30 billion of loss. So I think that like, what we should be doing, going to the ECB and, and going to the, 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 the Council perhaps on this, is asking not just for the 31 billion, but like there was 69.7 billion euro put into this. And it wouldn't take a genius you know, or an actuary to actually calculate what we've got back in terms of, you know, how much value we got from the sale of, of the um, of the EIB, um, the shares lately, and what we got back from from Bank of Ireland. So to offset one against the other, and then to offset all these that we paid in between, and say, here's the figure that we were forced to put in, and here's what we believe that we should have been putting in as a proportion, you know, population-wise of the eurozone, and this is what we're arguing about. And this is what Can I just ask one final question, one short question, uh, very short. Um, this year, obviously the promissory note is, uh, has caused serious damage, as you say, 34.7 billion euro, not a penny, that is that the government intend to, to, to reclaim back. The promissory note, as the injections went in, which started at 12,000 in 2010 up to 34,000, not one debate, not one vote in this House was, was required in relation to any of those uh, promissory notes signed by the Minister. As we approach now the 10th anniversary of the guarantee, do you believe that an appropriate thing would be to repeal the legislation that allows for a Minister solely to provide that type of financial commitment to financial institutions? We in this committee scrutinise every line 
of expenditure from government departments, but we have this out here that allows a minister <coughs> to commit billions upon billions of Irish taxpayers' money without any scrutiny or without any recourse to, to a vote within the House. So, is that something that you would call for or something you would support? Well, it's certainly something we support, but um, as a group, um, yes, it's not like we elect people to look after this and to do this, you know. Um, so it's not something that we kind of would get involved in, but I personally, I just find it extraordinary that that can happen. Absolutely extraordinary. That, you know, like, like you say, that like the, the doll here can examine line by line what's going to be spent, what's supposed to be spent in the budget, but a minister can, a finance minister can, and it's not even, it doesn't stop at 31 billion now, mm -hmm. because it's, there was no limit, there's no number on it. So it's any amount. So absolutely that should be looked at.